Uh, next, we'll move on to Dr. El Shirabagi. Please. Thank you, Josh. Um, and um, thank you all for being here. I, um, I would like first to, um, to say that I uh, really appreciated how Josh talked very cautiously using the word Arab Spring, which I um, never use uh, because um, the spring happens to people and the toppling of Mubarak did not happen to Egyptians. Actually, Egyptians toppled Mubarak. And also, the spring um, is beautiful in the United States and Europe, but uh, spring in Egypt means um, dust winds. It's not Hence really winds. particularly present, uh, yeah. pleasant, and therefore I don't think, um, I, I feel the word is, uh, or the term has been um, manufactured outside of Egypt and outside of the Arab world. Um, secondly, I, um, I need to, um, uh, to be uh, uh, candid with you uh, as much as I'm in pain for what's going on in my country at this moment, I am still very optimistic. I do not think uh, that we can talk about the Egyptian revolution as um, saying, for example, after the revolution <coughs> or post-revolution, because I think that the Egyptian revolution is still going on. It has not yet uh, uh, been over. And um, the, uh, the, the reason why I am uh, in pain is because I think that what's going on in Egypt now is going back, the politics of Egypt now goes back to um, how politics was handled under Mubarak. Um, what I mean by that is the political polarization, and um, I would explain, because we're here in a public um, uh, forum, that uh, we have um, two poles in Egypt, the Muslim brothers and uh, some Islamist um, um, uh, parties, um, and on the other side is the liberal left um, and other parties as well. Um, this polarization to me is um, killing Egypt, and I think that Americans will totally understand what I mean because they are suffering from polarization themselves, and the polarization has led to the sequestration and led to all of the gridlock in Congress. And I um, think that you will understand exactly why I'm in pain. But it's, uh, it's, um, it's more dangerous in Egypt because in Egypt, uh, Egypt now is in a critical uh, moment of its history where it should be um, working on um, um, getting together in order to rebuild a country that um, Mubarak has and his regime has actually undermined and um, uh, pushed into a colossal failure for 30 years on all fields and in all um, in all different dimensions, and therefore, uh, what I uh, would like to uh, to talk about is that, in my view, I do not think that this polarization is inevitable, was inevitable, or is inevitable and it doesn't have to be perpetuated. And to me, I think that the different, the two sides uh, would better stop quarreling about the details and face the core problems and core issues about which they are really um, uh, quarreling. Um, I would explain these two uh, arguments by saying for the fact that it's not inevitable, 
uh, is that, um, as many of you might already know, the Egyptian revolution did not happen uh, out of the blue. There has been a, a long um, a struggle by Egyptians in order to um, get rid of the corruption, brutality, and repression um, of the Mubarak regime. Um, and I would just um, refer to a movement that was the spark in 2003, which is the Kifaya movement, and Kifaya means enough. And the movement of Kifaya, the brilliance of it was that it was cross-ideological. People from the far left to the far right were involved in Kifaya, and that is a clear indication that Egypt is not destined to be polarized. Um, later on, um, the, um, there were also labor um, uh, protests, protests by people who were marginalized uh, by the neoliberal policies of the Mubarak regime. And here is when the young uh, generations have started to be heavily engaged. Now, the, because still the different political forces in Egypt, the political elite in Egypt under Mubarak could not work together, this was the main cause they were incapable of toppling Mubarak. Mubarak has been, had been brilliant in um, the divide and rule, and um, this was the main uh, reason why um, the Egyptian political forces were not able to topple him. Well, the young generation took it into their own hands, and they were the ones who triggered the revolution. None of them was partisan, and none of them was into this polarization. Um, the political elite, the polarized political elite, stepped in into the revolution that was triggered by the young generation. And throughout the 18 year, the 18 days of um, um, toppling uh, Mubarak, um, everybody was working together, i.e., the young generation has actually forced it on everyone to just be up to the responsibility and work together. Now, the fatal mistake, in my view, that the young generation has made immediately after the toppling of Mubarak is that they deferred to the older generation. And the older generation, instead of actually taking the the same elite that was incapable of making the change that Egypt needs, instead of taking the spirit of the 18 days, which was a golden moment to start a national dialogue and build a consensus on the real issues that are facing Egypt and that there are no consensus about, instead of doing that, they return to their politics as usual of polarization once more. And that polarization actually has not started by the Muslim brother coming to power. It actually started immediately after the revolution. And instead of you know, building together in order to build the future of Egypt, I think that what happened was that each side was trying to drag the military towards it. Um, what I think is going on right now is that all of the issues that are on the table in Egypt, that are discussed in Egypt, are not really the real issue. So there are quarrels about uh, the, the, the law on elections. There is a quarrel about the Constitution. We need guarantees in order to do this. Or um, uh, the Muslim brothers are doing this, uh, and so on. These are not, in my view, the real issues. 
because this is just a manifestation, a symptom of the lack of trust that comes from the lack of national consensus on the three main issues. Let us face it, this lack of trust comes from the fact that there is no consensus in Egypt about the relationship between religion and state. And this is one of the issues that must be faced, have a dialogue on, and reach a consensus. And none of the two sides is going to be winning. There has to be compromises. What I learned from American politics is the concept of compromise, which actually uh, is very clear even in the American Constitution. Now, um, the other, the second issue that people do not want to face, and uh, as a main issue of um, lack of national consensus, is the socioeconomic situation. The third issue is the issue of foreign policy. Where do we want to take Egypt in foreign policy? These are the three main core issues that Egypt has to, all the Egyptian political forces have to agree on. And these are the core issues that nobody talks about, and they are the reason why there is a lack of trust and each side is acting as if the other might do this or that. It seems to me without dealing with these issues, we are going to be um, perpetuating the same uh, old politics as usual. In order to do that, I think that, and all of them are my friends here, that the Muslim uh, brothers coming into this national dialogue have to um, abandon the arrogance of power and <laughs> the, the, uh, the opposition also have to uh, stop this arrogant sense of super, superiority of ideology and the all or none kind of politics. Without this on both sides, I think these three issues are not going to be solved and therefore we're going to be going into these vicious circles forever because people are not facing the real issues. Um, I would probably stop here and uh, we'll uh, thank you very much and let us have it Thank in you the very discussion. much, Dr. Sherbagi. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Darag, the floor is yours. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I'm kind of getting used to being here. I was here <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> and uh, probably I have a feeling that I'm going to be offered a job in this place, but uh, <laughs> if I perform well, so it's, uh, that's a good motivation for me. Uh, actually, uh, I'm going to talk from a little bit different perspective. I mean, the overall tone that we have been hearing, unfortunately, is towards the negative sides. Um, by nature, and also by, by following up what's really happening, I'm, I'm optimistic, and I would like to reflect this on you uh, one way or the other. Uh, but first of all, I would like to clarify something. People uh, uh, keep on talking here about the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim, we are talking now about practicing politics and, and going into par, uh, par, uh, elections and uh, trying to seek majority and government. So we are talking about political party. And I represent the Freedom and Justice Party. And maybe to your surprise, many of you may not know that more than 70% of the members of the Freedom and Justice Party right now do not belong to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, our membership is probably exceeding 500,000 people right now uh, after one year of, of, of establishment, uh, no, uh, one and a half years of establishment, uh, not more than uh, only 25 to 30 percent do belong to the Muslim Brotherhood. So this is just a, a clarifying point. I do agree with my colleagues that I don't like the, the term the, the, to translate our Thawra into, uh, into uprising. This is a very, uh, uh, the term is very short in describing what really happens. And, uh, and I also do agree that we are still going through the revolution. 
But I hope that we, end, we don't end up uh, with uh, someone like Al-Qadhafi ended up with, you know, maybe a couple of days before he died, he was saying that this revolution is still continuous. I mean, he was, <laughs> since he made the revolution in 1969, he thought that his revolution is still continuing until he was killed. So, uh, but uh, hopefully we, we are going to uh, have our, our real revolution uh, succeed uh, uh, much you earlier than that. that. Do yeah. you intend to stay no, 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 for 30 no, no, years? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, if, if, if I want to go to the con context of the, of the overall context of, of our panel today, which is, seems to be like a comparative uh, look at other countries that went through the same uh, conditions, I, I'm afraid that this issue is not touched by my, my colleagues, so let me a little bit touch upon this. Um, uh, actually, comparing what happened in Egypt to these countries now, I mean, what, what we achieved in Egypt compared to the other countries, I do believe that by far we are at a much better position, at a much uh, uh, more you know, superior position in terms of achieving what we wanted to achieve. And let me explain how. Uh, first of all, we managed to, like other countries, we managed to all of a sudden within very few days to get rid of Mubarak himself as the tyrant that everybody wanted him to go away. And we also, once and for all, ended the inheritance pro, uh, project that Mubarak wanted to, inherit, to, 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 to give, to pass his, uh, his authorities to his son, and that's also, that also was over. Nobody expected on the 24th of January, or maybe even on the 28th of January, that the events would have led to these uh, results. But afterwards, we had several other achievements that did not really take place in other countries. First of all, we, for the first time in the Egyptian history, we had a freely elected president. Whether some like that president and some do not like that president, yet that is a freely elected president uh, uh, coming out of a group of candidates, two stages of elections, and he was elected by 51 or 52 percent of the votes. That's a significant uh, and significant achievement for Egypt. It did not happen since the establishment of Egypt some 7,000 7, years ago. Okay, so this is this is a significant achievement, and it, it is thanks to the revolution. Okay. Number two, uh, we had uh, uh, parliamentary elections, and also for the first time, but not in Egyptian history, maybe in 60 years, because Egypt had used to have a very good uh, uh, practice of democracy before the 1952 revolution, uh, uh, with very active political parties and very active political life and parliament and constitutions and all these sort of things. But this stopped for 60 years and then came back. And all of a sudden, you find more than 30 million people standing in lines, very long lines, to give their votes to the person or to the list that they believe represent them the best, the best way possible. Uh, it, it is true that that parliament was later on dissolved by, uh, by um, a, a very wrong decision, a very wrong court decision, uh, that I believe that was very wrong, and I, I, I believe Dr. Hamza shares this opinion with me. But uh, nevertheless, with, you know, no matter we, we, if you agree with that parliament or you do not agree with it, the notion that people, for the first time in, in so many years, believe that their vote makes a difference and whatever they put in the box will be reflected as a result in selecting who they believe would represent them the best way possible, this is also a significant achievement. And if the previous parliament was dissolved, we are going to have another parliament and another parliament. And so the, the, we, we are not, never going to get back to the day where somebody else used to vote on behalf of me or Dr. Manar or, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, this day will never come back. Uh, number three or four, we, uh, we, we could achieve a constitution. And again, uh, some people may not like the end result uh, of this constitution document, uh, 
uh, uh, it passed with a reasonable majority, yes, maybe not an overwhelming majority, but a reasonable majority. But still, it is very important at this critical stage to uh, have a document like this which defines clearly the limits between the different authorities and, and the checks and different checks and balances. And, and this is the part actually that is not really that much disputed. I mean, differences are about other things that can be, you know, discussed and, and, and changed with time. But, but to put the country on, 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 the, on the correct path of uh, forming the democratic institutions, this is something that is well established in the Constitution, and I believe it's a very good basis to start. And if you compare this to, to the other so-called Arab Spring countries, uh, they are nowhere near this. Uh, I was, last month I was in Tunisia in a seminar comparing the democratic path in Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya. And uh, uh, in, in Tunisia, they have been working on the constitution for more than a year and a half, or, or almost a year and a half, and it doesn't seem to me that they are going to reach a document very soon. They are still not succeeding in achieving a consensus. Uh, uh, of course, the, their, their, uh, their top leaders are not directly elected. Uh, if you talk about Libya, it's, it's, it's even more dramatic. Uh, uh, you know, you have people having arms everywhere in the country. The state uh, functions are not functioning, and uh, it's, it's, it's a mess. They, they, they have been work, trying to work on the Constitution for nine months, and they haven't put any single word in, in, in the document. So, I, I hope they, you know, they, their, their, uh, their path gets better, but, uh, but definitely if I look to Egypt, I, f I, I have a feeling that we are uh, on a much, uh, uh, much better uh, path. Um, it is our, our, in the Freedom and Justice Party, our strategy has always been to, that the, the top priority in the country after the revolution is to have the democratic institutions established. This is very important. And that was really the path that was established in a referendum uh, back in March of 2011, uh, where it was you know, envisaged to have a, a, a parliament and president elected after, only after six months of the, of, the, uh, of the date of the referendum and followed by, uh, by having the constitution. And there were a lot of arguments at that time uh, about you know whether the constitution should come first or the elections come first or you know that the new parties are not ready for elections so let's wait a little bit longer and I think this is one of the of the of the mistakes that that uh, uh, led us to what we are going through right now I mean if we if we really uh, uh, had uh, these democratic institutions six months after uh, after the revolution uh, we probably would have been in a much uh, much better shape. But nevertheless, time has not, uh, I mean, has not passed completely. Yes, we are, we are going through problems. Yes, there are, there are economical difficulties, there are social difficulties, but nothing beyond the solution. And, uh, and uh, hopefully, when we, when we have the, the House of Representatives elected, in few, hopefully in a few months, we're going to put ourselves on the, on the, on the road for, for real reform and real change. Of course, we cannot wait. I know that many people here uh, do not uh, like the idea that, uh, that uh, we are tying the big reform with the parliament, uh, completing the parliamentary elections, which is, which maybe they have, of course, they have a point, uh, but, uh, but still it has been proven everywhere in the world for countries going through transitions, major transi transitions like the one we are going through, is that the most important step is to have uh, uh, democratic institutions formed in order to be able to push yourself forward and have the reform that you really want to have uh, in place. Uh, definitely, I agree with Dr. Amr Hamzawi on everything negative he said about the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't agree about it. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. I, 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 I'm always of the opinion that we are all on uh, a learning curve. I always uh, There's a use this. between a liberal uh, party representative and a representative of freedom and justice. Yeah, no, no, so you're, you're like what I'm going to say right now. Yeah, no, no, wait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I believe that everybody in Egypt is on a learning curve. And, and this applies to starting from the Freedom and Justice Party, 
opposition, uh, uh, the military during the time they were in control of the of the political uh, uh, scene, you know, over the a year and a half after the revolution. Mm -hmm. But I'm also putting uh, uh, actually some blame on the youth of Egypt. And I was having a discussion this morning with one of my, uh, my a young man of one of my best friends here. And you know, I, I, I hear the normal complaint that uh, young people are, have not, never been empowered and they are not getting their chances and, and, and all these uh, kind of arguments. And I simply told him that you know, if, if, we, if we acknowledge that uh, almost 80% of the population are less than, are, are, are younger than 40 years of age. Who is preventing young people from being actively involved in the political scene and getting the support of this big mess? I mean, who is electing older people? If 80% of the voters are young and they are still electing the older people, there, is, there must be something wrong. It's either they are not convinced that the young people are still are, are, are well enough mm -hmm. to, to, to take care of the of the scene of the political scene and the, and the young people are not yet prepared to do this work or they are convinced with the uh, older people okay but uh, but I, what I believe is that the, the, the young people co go, coming out of the revolutionary uh, phase and feelings they are very enthusiastic in a way that, that uh, they need to calm down a little bit and, and, and really think about, or at least some of them, think about of having their own political parties, their own institutions, in order, and, and their own programs, and their own ideas of, re of reform, in order to present that to the population that they belong to, and they get elected, and they, 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 they pursue the reform they want. And this is actually bound to happen. I mean, in, in, in 10 years from now, this 80% is going to be 90%, and, and, uh, and this is bound to happen. But, but I mean, they, 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 they take some of the blame, I, I believe. But uh, uh, finally, the, 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 I forgot something very important to mention about, uh, about positive uh, achievements. After 60 years of military control of the political scene, uh, uh, we managed very quickly to, to, to end this phase. And this is quite a significant achievement compared to many other countries that went through the same kind of change uh, the, uh, that the military used to control the political life. Uh, uh, we, we are, this morning, we, we were having a discussion with uh, particularly Dr. Uh, Am. Okay, no, I, actually I took the, the least amount of time. No, I'm, I'm watching. watching the clock. Okay, <laughs> uh, the final word, the positive one. Uh, I, I felt that uh, I, what I heard from Dr. Hamzawi uh, about he gave some propositions of like an agenda to be discussed, you know, to, to, towards achieving some consensus at this, uh, at this stage. And I found most of what he said very reasonable, very uh, uh, positive, and really going to help, uh, you know, with some, you know, discussions, you know, on, on our part. But we, I believe that now we are starting to move ahead. Uh, the only thing that happened is that, was that Josh suggested, made, made a suggestion that actually it was agreed between me, Dr. Amr, and Dr. Zaid, you know, from the opposition and the, and the majority to, to say thank you, but no thank you to, to that proposition. <laughs> I'm glad that I can unite people. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop here. Fantastic. Thank you very much.